So today you will hear about three solutions on workflow optimization from three different labs. But we will start with uh, clinical aspects. So we will learn how is calprotectin used in a clinic. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Patrick van Rennen, pediatric gastroenterologist from University Medical Center in Groningen, Netherlands. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, here are my disclosures. Um, and I would like to uh, start getting explicit immediately. Um, calprotectin comes from uh, neutrophils. And when there is an uh, inflammation in the um, uh, gastrointestinal tract, neutrophils move to that area of inflammation and they actively excrete uh, calprotectin or they leak calprotectin when the cells uh, degrade. And what you get then is an, um, some kind of a marination of the mucosal layer of the gastro gastrointestinal tract. And if a uh, feces comes into contact with this uh, inflamed mucosa and slides along the gastrointestinal tract, slowly, slowly the, um, the stool is also marinated in calprotectin. Now you saw this very slow movement of the stool. So this is a slow transit time. And now see what happens when you have a fast transit time. That means that the concentration of calprotectin in the stool will be much lower. So why do I tell you this? Calprotectin concentration in the stool is not only dependent on neutrophil involvement, but also on the extensiveness of inflammation, the severity of inflammation, and most important, the contact time. How does that work? Um, in the jejunum, which is the first part of the small intestine, the stool is very liquid. So that means that the contact time with the mucosa is very short. And uh, when the stool moves to the end of the gastrointestinal tract, the, um, uh, the passage is much, much slower. So the transit time in the rectum is the longest. We, the rectum was invented for that, to, to hold the stool until you have time to open your bowels. Calprotectin is a uh, protein that is uh, um, seen a lot in patients with active IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. And there are two important phenotypes of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But it is not specific for inflammatory bowel disease. When you have an infectious enterocolitis caused by bacteria or viruses, you can also, also have an increased calprotectin. When patients use non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, you can have an increase in calprotectin. Food allergies that are not treated give an increase in calprotectin. Polyps, untreated celiac disease, and even colorectal carcinoma. And what is also important is that young age gives an increase in calprotectin. Nobody exactly knows why this is, but there are ideas that it is related to the constant fight between the bacteria at the mucosal level in the first five years of life. And only after five years of life, there is some kind of a bacterial balance in the, uh, in the gut of children. I want to explain two important uh, purposes for using the calprotectin test. And the first one is uh, screening or triaging for endoscopy. So for that reason, uh, the test should be uh, able to distinguish between inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome or functional abdominal pain. And for that, you only need a single test. Uh, I'm going to explain this first, and later on, I will also explain the second purpose of the test, which is monitoring. So the perfect, the perfect screening test looks like this. Calprotectin is only uh, in the low ranges in patients with functional abdominal pain and in the high ranges when patients have um, inflammatory bowel disease. So if you draw a, a line just between these two distributions of calprotectin, you will see the perfect screening test. You won't have false positive results and you will not have false negative results. But unfortunately, 
this is only an ideal test, but not the real world test. This is what fecal calprotectin uh, distributions look like in patients with IBD and uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So there is a great uh, proportion of overlap. So where do we draw the threshold? Where do we draw the cut point? If we do it too low, then the result will be we won't have false negative patients, but there will be a lot of false positive uh, patients. And if we draw the line too high, then we won't have any false positives, but a lot of false negative patients. So how do we re um, uh, resolve this problem? Um, in the hospital where I work, and in many uh, pediatric uh, uh, clinics, they use the two threshold strategy, and it works like this. If you have a uh, fecal calprotectin result, which is 250 or above, then there's a very high risk of uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and sh you should uh, expose the patient, and in this uh, um, example, you ex should expose a child to endoscopy, and you need uh, anesthesia for that. When the result is below 50, then uh, there is absolutely no risk of having inflammatory bowel disease. And then there is some area in between, and that gives room for shared decision making. In the uh, red area, the risk for IBD is 85% or higher. And in the green area, the risk for IBD is really negligible. 0%. And in the yellow area in between, there is a 5% risk, and that is the reason why you should also look for other causes of uh, diarrhea and abdominal pain, and perhaps retest after a month before you proceed to uh, endoscopy. Uh, the second purpose of the fecal calprotectin test is monitoring the disease course. And monitoring, you can divide that into two uh, different areas. The first one is the early recognition of a relapse or a flare, and secondly, a response to treatment. And for that, you need serial measurements. And why do we need that? Because uh, a lot of adult gastroenterologists, for instance, would say, oh, we don't need uh, fecal calprotectin for that. We just scope the patient again. But you cannot uh, uh, expose children to uh, um, endoscopy all the time. And secondly, what is also very important, patients are very unreliable in reporting their symptoms. Uh, as a clinician, I would like to have all my patients to behave like an owl, so very wise patients that immediately contact uh, the doctor when they have an increase in symptoms, but they are not like that because patients are afraid of undergoing an endoscopy. They are afraid of uh, uh, using uh, steroids again. So a lot of the teenagers just do not say anything to their parents or to the doctor. But if you have an, uh, a test that can uh, re reliably say that, that there is uh, inflammation going on, that would help. So um, in order to overcome the ostrich behavior of most teenagers, we also use the fecal calprotectin test. And monitoring uh, um, patients with IBD based on the calprotectin results works like this. Uh, as doctors, we try to strive for uh, calprotectin results in the green range. This is the target range. And that correlates well with, with uh, mucosal healing. And that is the target that we aim for as doctors. So no uh, inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract anymore. And values above 500, then we are very certain that there is an inflammation going on. Again, we use a two threshold strategy. So there is an, uh, a region in between that uh, gives reason for close monitoring, so for retesting in a month before you decide to change your uh, treatment. Now here's an example how uh, monitoring works in patients with uh, IBD. In the first stage, which is shown here on the left side, this is the moment that we used the test for triaging for endoscopy. So uh, um, we should have results in the red area before we um, diagnose a patient as IBD. And then we start treating the patient with anti-inflammatory drugs. And what you would like to see is a decrease in the um, concentration of calprotectin up to the target range, the green range. And when we have reached that stage, then um, we are in stage three of monitoring. 
And from that moment onwards, we use the test to detect an early flare. And then the interval between testing will be a bit longer, three months instead of one month. And then as soon as the um, calprotectin rises out of the target range, then uh, we uh, shorten the testing interval. And if it reaches the red area, we uh, have to change our uh, treatment plan. This is how it works for us. So a lot of doctors think that uh, they are doing a good job when there is an, uh, a decrease of calprotectin. For instance, from uh, a value of 2,000 to 1,000 micrograms per gram. But that is absolutely not the case. Probably a decrease in the red area is a meaningless decrease. And you have to follow the calprotectin over time. But the decrease from the red area really into the green area that is a relevant decrease, because then you have really reached mucosal healing again. Now, this is quite simple. Uh, Calprotectin-based uh, um, monitoring of patients, but the collection is a problem. Um, and stool sampling is nobody's hobby, and this is a, a reality in the Netherlands. Um, the teenager is able to produce the stool, but he will always ask, he or she will always ask the parent to, uh, to scoop it in a tube and send it to the lab. And in order to overcome this, um, um, there is a, a new development, which is called uh, home testing, and it's based on the lateral flow-based principle. And um, the sampling also becomes much more easy because you can use the grooved pin instead of a scoop. And that's much clearer for um, patients or parents. And uh, we tested the, um, the home test and compared it with its uh, companion ELISA. We did that for three different uh, uh, manufacturers, and there is quite an, uh, a good agreement in the low range, and that is the range where we need to be very accurate. In the high range, the red area, it is less of an importance to have uh, accuracy. Of course, it should not be a very wide uh, uh, variety of uh, uh, results, but you really need the accuracy in the green and the uh, yellow range. So I want to uh, uh, end my talk with giving some tips. And the first one is you have to try to uh, advise the patient to collect the first stool after a night's sleep. But unfortunately, it's not urine and uh, a patient does not have so much control over the moment of uh, opening bowels. Secondly, uh, the use of a stool collection paper is uh, advisable because it, then it's not mixed with the, uh, the flushing water of the toilet. And uh, it's good to uh, store the um, stool in a refrigerator until it is delivered at the laboratory. And the reason for that is that there is some degradation of the protein at room temperature. So not use the, um, um, the calprotectin test in children below five years because it's difficult to interpret the results. And finally, if you use a treat to target strategy, the monitoring strategy that I just explained, then it's always uh, it's good to always use the same assay because there is uh, quite a difference between the uh, assays that are on, on the market. And with this, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Fabiano. Are there any questions? I can ask questions. Okay, uh, some it. laboratories are reporting results that are over the measuring range of the method as more than, yep. so more than 2,000 milligram per kilo. Yep. How important is it to get results uh, in a higher range, uh, like five or 6,000 or 16? Yeah, well, as a clinician, I'm perfectly happy with uh, the report over 2,000, because then I know there is really an active inflammation going on. The only reason to also try to report the exact concentration in the higher range is that you want to see the first effects of a treatment response. For that, it could be useful to report it. But, um, so it's mostly monitoring. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you.